and said, hey, Knuckles, what are you doing? I said, hey, Proby, how are you? What's going on? He said, I'm in Vancouver. He said, come on, come on, why don't you take a ride up and, and, and spend the weekend with me? I said, well, when are you heading back to Detroit? He says, tomorrow. I'm in Oregon. <laughs> I said, Bob, I'm in Oregon. I'm like... 17 hour drive from where you told are. you he zero thought, concept of time zero yeah he just thought <laughs> like i could jump in the car and you know buzz over there in two hours when i stepped on the ice i never backed down and i never stayed down and i was vicious and i was malicious and i don't care <laughs> Look at him going to town. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. Alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Danny, Danny. Nux, you look so good. Look yeah. at you. And you look gorgeous as usual. Thank you, sir. Thank Been you. so long. You don't look a day older. Here we go. Than the, no, I'm serious. Than the day I met you, and the day I met you was in England. Wow. That what was the first was time I met you. Was it, what was it, 2003? Yeah, something like that, 2004 or something. He said the same thing to me, too, when he first met me. So just, it just wasn't in good <laughs> enough. Aww, that's awesome. I'm Tim, by the way. I know we've never met. <laughs> Hi, Tim. How's the cold? You okay? It's good today. Yeah. You know, okay, just because I don't know. I just I, caught, I, I, I just <laughs> caught you the tail that? end of yeah. that. No, I did. I'm, I'm coming around, recovering, I guess. No, he oh, always awesome. talks through his nose. Yeah, like I mean, that. who knows what a yeah. cold is nowadays, right? So, <laughs> yeah. But well, welcome to the show, and Thanks. it's just awesome t that you took the time today to to join Tim and I. Um, I want to get right to it, and I I, I want to first go. God, I, it's unbelievable what you've done since Bob has passed. But I want to go to Bob passing. I, I and, and I say that because. You know, I found myself sitting in that church looking at the videos of, you know, your family. And I was really pissed off at Bob. I was angry with Bob, and I'll tell you why. And, you know, we became friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I absolutely love the guy. And he came to me. We were at a tournament in Toronto. And he came to me, we were rooming, actually, and he said, Knuckles. He said, God, I don't know if I'm smoking too much or what, but I, I got to cut back. He said, in my chest, is, I feel tightness in my chest, and I'm there, Bob. Not for nothing, but, yeah, smoking certainly got something to do with it, but that's not a good sign. I said, I have a friend who had a heart condition, and that is one of the major signs that you got something going on. And I sat there, and I couldn't help but think. He said, oh, I don't know. I just, I'm just going to quit smoking. I, and afterwards, I found out that, like, lots of guys said stuff to him, you know, to go see a doctor. And I know you did, too. Now, why would he not go see a doctor? He's a guy, stubborn mule. I think that you guys had it so easy when you played with the doctors coming and going and doing physicals and everything, right? When you guys were playing. And uh, that was something after retirement, Bob, did it, he didn't keep up. He wasn't doing his annual physicals. He wasn't taking care of himself. So, I mean, that way with seeing regular checkups and stuff, right? And um, I know Nux, when he, it was about six weeks, eight weeks before he passed away. He, uh, we were out in the lounge. You were in the lounge in the garage with us yeah. before. And uh He's having a cigarette, whatever, and he put it out and he went to stand up and he he almost passed out. Like he had to sit back down again. So he had a couple, he knew it too, but I just think he was a stubborn mule and he just didn't, I mean, I said it, you said it, how many of the guys had said it to him and um, he didn't, he didn't follow up. Yeah. He take, take um, care of his ticker. Now his dad's history, didn't his dad die at a young age? Was His father was a cop in Windsor, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, Big Al, he was a cop and he died at 52. Uh, he had a stroke the year before and then eventually he ended up going into a coma and passing away a year later. But yep, heart disease was definitely on the probert side. So it's something my kids are aware of. We keep an eye on with them. You know, it's in the family. So um, and Bob was aware and Bob had this eerie thing about him, too, where he didn't think he was going to live a long life. He really held on to that for some reason. I was just thinking about like like you right right away you said like he's a he's a guy. I, I think like 
like my dad's, you know, he's still alive, but he's, he's not the healthiest and, but he doesn't believe in doctors. Like you can't get him to go to a doctor. And I think that's like right away that I kind of related to, you know, just how guys think, like we think, you know, we can naturally, we don't need the help or we don't need to get checked up. So that makes sense for sure. And I'm, I'm obviously learning a lot here and I appreciate you also coming on as well. So I'm excited for, for this too. Well, thanks for having me. And I, I don't like saying that about men in general, but I mean, let's face it, the percentage of guys that just won't go to the, you know, my, my own father, same way. I mean, if he's really, really sick, maybe he'll go, but he doesn't do checkups and stuff like that. He doesn't, sounds like your dad, actually, <laughs> yeah. but he's, um, yeah, I mean, Bob just didn't uh, stay on top of his health after. And I remember actually next, I, we went at the funeral and um, when we we're doing the visitation and all the guys coming up to me, all the old teammates and, and players, friends, and in that age group as well. And, you know, through the tears and the hugs and everything is all these guys, every time I hug them, I'm like, go get checked, take care of yourself, go get your physicals. Like I just said it to everybody because I was just so concerned. It was just that um, everything happened so quickly, but did it. I mean, there were signs now, like he's gone. You could look at his, his fingers. You could see the circulation. Someone noticed in a picture. Actually, the co-author of the book, Kirsty, had mentioned that. And there were a few things that people pointed out Well. We didn't go to the doctor. God bless you for what you've done with your four children. Um, it's just incredible. Brogan, Tanny, Declan, and Jack being twins. Um, you know, I know firsthand my sister lost her husband. He was a cop and uh, just outside of Boston, lost his life in line of duty. She had um, <laughs> five kids between the age oh, of... wow. Yeah, yeah, between the age of two and 11 years old. And I know, yeah, it took a village to bring those kids up. But my sister, she dug in uh, the backbone. She toughened. She was toughy anyway. But it's amazing, the resilience. And uh, she put her head down and just moved forward. And, and you know, things are well today. How difficult, and I, and I do want to go back to the beginning with you and Bob, but how difficult a time was that? You must have felt like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders absolutely you know honestly it was a blur it really was i mean it was just such a a whirlwind with my my, my first thought i oh worst day of my life my goodness and, and knowing i had to go home and tell my four kids that their dad didn't make it two of them were on the boat with us and knowing i had to walk in and tell them that and uh you're right everyone really stepped up and and helped with the kids and um it just, and the whirlwind with the media, like it's just different, like going home and all the, the, the news, the cameras in my driveway and oh, it was ridiculous. And, and then following that up with, with completing the book, following through with the book. And, um, and I have to also thank you, Nux, for saying and moving forward. That's a big thing for, for me to say that. I hate it when people say move on. Yeah. Move on from what? I like saying moving forward. And that was a thing that we, we really had to work on as a family. Like we were a team. We had to really stick together and um, support each other through that, especially that first year. Um, it was tough. But we made it. Today I had a really tough day. I got to tell you, this morning was one of those awesome milestones that uh, got me a little choked up. Jack started his first big boy job. He's an architect now, Nux. Oh, it's official. Un unbelievable well, I, I know think. so he pulled out he pulled out of the driveway and I got all choked up and I just looked up I'm like you're missing another awesome moment in our lives but I'm, I I like to believe he's looking down and smiling so yeah and he would yeah. be that's for sure and, and, and listen I, I we started there and I wanted to start with that anger I have with Bob and I have since forgiven him God I love him I, I love that man he was he was such a big kid and um Let's go back. Let's just go back okay. to how the hell did you two meet and what did you see in him? Oh, come on. He was so hot. <laughs> that physical attraction right off with that, the frosted tips and that acid wash jacket that he had on and the matching <laughs> jeans, the Canadian tuxedo. And he was staying at the hotel. I was working at the front desk, having a little hiatus, of course. He couldn't get across the border, so he was hiding out at the Relax Plaza. And... Um, he just got my phone number and gave me a call and that was it we started dating on and off for a couple of years and saw him through a few rehabs went through some stuff and got married in 93 hell of a ride wow and did you you were yeah. 
he was play. I mean, did you play, like, follow hockey then, or were you a big hockey fan? Or I mean, I'm, I'm a Canadian, so oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it's kind of a natural, yeah. 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 But um, did I really? I mean, he was a hometown boy, so you heard his name, and that's about it. But no, I didn't really follow him. He was in his, I think, his third year with Detroit. Oh. That 93, all right, that's when you met, or you got married in 93? No, we met in 88, 88. and uh, we got married in 93. We lived together for a couple of years, and yeah. So uh, living together, obviously, and then Bob uh, being the hockey player, yes, and his first year in Detroit was 86, 87, mm-hmm. Bob Park, yeah, 86, 87. So now Bob apparently didn't do drugs up until or cocaine up until the point he played pro hockey um um i think it was uh adirondack actually coming back from winning the calder cup okay yeah that, that, so it was like you're right he was up and down then at that point. in that yeah. ballpark um mm-hmm. now was he open with you about that back at the time when he was playing and and um or, or did he kind of keep that secret yeah it was kept a secret yeah I mean, he was pretty good at hiding it. And um, I mean, he was trying to, to, you know, stay straight. I think he had just gotten out of the stint at Betty Ford, I think. And, um, you know, the wings were so patient with him and awesome. And they sent him away and he'd come out and uh, setting up aftercare programs and everything for him. And uh, at that time, he was staying at the hotel. Yeah, I didn't really know much of going on. He was he was. He was just really good looking, and that's all I was focusing on. I didn't really notice much anything else, and uh, we weren't going out. It wasn't like we were out drinking and partying. It wasn't that kind of lifestyle. That didn't come until later on, months down the road. But yeah, he really did try to keep it, you know, a secret. So, him playing NHL, Detroit Red Wings, obviously the big man on campus would uh, being able to uh, do the job he did. How was that for you? That part. Being Bob's wife, someone who loves him dearly, uh, your significant other, and then sitting there because I always, I always go back to my uh, my ex wife now, Karen. How you know she always told me when you fought, so honest. Because I, I asked, I said, "How how do you feel when I'm out there fighting? Like what what goes through your mind?" She said, "You know what? Honestly, I watch." She said, "I I don't worry about it so much. I don't get nervous because I." I like you never get hurt and you always seem like you have an edge. So I, but th- to me, that's unique because she wasn't that nervous and she's a nervous person. She had this confidence that I was going to be okay. How, was that with you the same way with Bob? I think gradually, I think the first couple of games, I mean, I was, uh, heck, I didn't know what to expect, you know, and, and seeing that I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't even watch this. And then once you know, like Karen, um, getting to know Bob and later on and living with him and and seeing, you know, I had confidence in him. I knew he was good at what he did and uh, started cheering him on, standing on my feet and just, all right, you got this. (laughs) Absolutely. No, that's great. I can't can't relate to the fighting. I played, but I fought, like I tell Nux all the time, like I fought the puck maybe once in a while, but I didn't, I've never (laughs) fought human beings. I had, I had people do that for me. You know, and cause I, I, had the opportunity to meet him and I fought him once and it was really not a good fight on my part or his. We both went down early in the fight and um, Bob, and and I remember the feeling before games and I, you know, I had that little bit of, not insecurity, I was just afraid of losing a fight. I didn't want to lose a fight. Bob, did you ever see him like, because man, when he's on that ice, it was like, he was a different animal and he just seemed like and I couldn't show my fear to my teammates. I'm sure he never did, but man, did he ever have any of those insecurities about guys he might have had to fight coming up? And if he did, would he ever mention it to you? Or did you sense it at all? No, you want to know what honestly Chris, the first time I actually heard that he lost sleep over any of that was when I watched the Ice Guardians. Okay. I had no idea that he'd have some sleepless nights or toss and turn or any of that stuff. I do know for a fact, like the one fight that he actually prepared for physically and psychologically, like mentally, he was in the zone was the Tai Domi rematch. That was the only one that was in our house that affected our daily lives. It's what he talked about. And he was training for that rematch. 
And yeah. um, other than that, no, nothing ever. I always looked at him as one of those guys, just not then phased him. And then I got to know him, and I'm like, God, what a, he was a sweetheart, obviously. Um, super um, guy, really fun to be around, fun to be with. Um, you know, simple in a lot of ways. He was like a kid, Bob. Yeah, he was my biggest kid. We joked about that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Captain ADHD, nonstop. <laughs> but he was a big teddy bear. I mean, he really was a good guy. Yeah, no, I, I heard, you know, I played like I played with Chelios and, and a, a couple guys that, you know, I, I grew up a fan. I'm obviously I'm like 40 years younger than Nux. So I grew up a lot, you know, I'm just kidding. Nux, but I am <laughs> obviously a big age difference. And I grew up my my family's from uh, from Michigan. So grew up a big Red Wings fan and 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 obviously the the Blues brothers him and Kosher and and obviously uh, I was a big Steve Eisman fan so I, I I grew up a fan and then I saw the documentary and but where I was going with that too was just kind of like every guy I played with you know towards the uh that got to play with him just they said like amazing things like you never like they like you said he was just like this big teddy bear and I think that for me and my experience, a lot of those guys that played that role were like usually the best guys in the locker room, the nicest guys, except Knox, maybe. But, but yeah. no, it's uh, <laughs> I mean, it's good to hear. I and Bob, listen, he, he was as tough as he was. He could play hockey, and that's the thing. And you know, I certainly it's one of the things that I was probably most proud of in my career. Yeah, the fighting pot. That honestly, I didn't. I, I really enjoyed that pot, but. What I really enjoyed doing was scoring goals or, or helping my team in other ways than just fighting. You know, when he was there in Detroit in those years in Detroit and going through all that turbulence and them trying to, uh, and you said uh, the wings were really good to him and trying to help him along. How about the league itself? Do you think the league in any way failed them or they could have done more in trying to help Bob, um, I guess, stay on that path. I don't know, Nux. You know what that generation was like, that era of hockey. I mean, you know, I think a lot of stuff was dealt with in-house, right? Per team, whatever was going on, whatever crap that they had to deal with. And I think if uh, you had a coach or whatever that started talking a little too much and stuff got out in the press and then, you know, had everything had to be managed, you know, everything had to be dealt with. I think that um, as far as the team, I think they were great with Bob. I remember all the things they did for them, for him and his family. And then with me coming in afterwards as well, um, very supportive. And they exhausted every effort with him. And he was so young. Um, as for the league, I don't know if I can pin anything on them. I mean, it was just, I mean, gosh, it's almost seemed like Bob was the big example that they, you know, the NHL, the policy, the drug policy that they have in place now. It's almost like he wrote the book. They used him as the major don't, you know, yeah. like he was the example and it led the way with the whole, you know, three strikes you're out or whatever the system is in place now. I mean, gosh, I think Bob was the first one to, to go through that with the program. Yeah, he really was. And, and I, I remember, and I heard some things about back in Detroit with Colin Campbell. Apparently he, he was a guy that like, like he's a hot ass for a little guy. But apparently he challenged Bob a couple of times, right? Like he really tried to get to Bob. And, and can you tell us, shed a little light on that relationship with those two? Those two are like brothers. They were like family. And uh, Soupy just, I mean, gosh, Bob's mom, Teresa, babysat for the Campbells. They lived here in Windsor. And um, <clears throat> they they had a really good friendship. And I think that... You know, when Bob was screwing up, you know, Soupy's looking at him like, my little brother, get your shit together. And um, yeah, there was a, a few altercations. And one, I think that uh, Soupy, I don't know, he got a broken nose or a black eye or he got something, cut something from one of the altercations after a game or a practice or something. But everyone was rooting for him. Most For the most part, most teammates, I mean, there was a couple goofs, but for the most part, the guys were behind him, Soupy. Um, you know, they were really trying to get them on, keep them on the right track. So that right track. And, um, when we talk now, what, and I often think, God, the balls of them or the no brains of them having it. And maybe, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but know. Tr thinking about crossing the border with a big bag of cocaine down your pants you got to go through that, you know, 
Customs and Immigration. At did like three, four in the morning. What was he thinking? Yeah, and then, yeah, well, listen, he probably wasn't. One, he, you know, he had a few cocktails in him, right? And he probably, said, oh, I'll just slip through. I'll give him that old A. Hey, yeah, Bob from the Red Wings. And no, it, it was Bob from the Red Wings, you know, up With against drugs the cops. Yeah. 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 And I remember when that it happened. And again, I was along in my career, and I remember, um, we had a player on our team, a young kid, Rick Natras, who got caught with a marijuana cigarette. And he ended up being suspended for the whole season. Really? And it, when that happened with Bob, only a few years later, I'm like, wow. Man, he's done. Yeah, he's in trouble. Like, this is, this is big. And uh, it's amazing that he did get some help from the league. But you know, they, again, everything wasn't bad. Some of the night, uh, how about the kids? And uh, th again, did they, did they know the aura of Bob and what, you know, other than being dad, but dad, the hockey player, when did no. that kind of register with the kids or were they still too young? Uh, I, th I think the older two had a grasp of, okay, dad's, you know, doesn't have your typical nine to five job. And um, we were fortunate because we were living in Chicago when the kids were watching him play, right? And in the city of Chicago, as much as they have, the, you know, the Hawks yeah. are awesome. Yeah, that's the lowest on the pole in yeah. that city. I mean, the, the Bulls were, you know, the big sport team at the time. And of course, you got the Bears and then you have two baseball teams and then you have all the celebrity in that town. So, I mean, you it really blended in nicely in the city of Chicago. So my kids didn't really feel it there. I think it was more so in retirement and him doing the alumni circuit and um, and then the kids getting just enough old enough to see like, why do you want your picture with my dad? Why are you bugging my, why is my dad writing his name down? And they started to clue in. It was after retirement more so. Well, how, how about for you, okay, the, those years in Detroit and then moving over to Chicago. Now, did the whole family move to Chicago? Um, yep. I was pregnant with Brogan. He, we went there in, uh, he signed in the summer of 94. Okay. She was born in September. Then he had a little stint in uh, California. So we we're out there for the first year, the first season with uh, the Hawks. So um, then we just continued. We had our family there and then our extended family would come and visit us, of, of course. But um, yeah, it was I didn't think Bob, <laughs> with you talking about figuring out when Bob's a big deal, I think one of the first times we went out for a nice dinner in a restaurant and a girl followed him into the bathroom. <laughs> I realized, mm -hmm. oh, oh, that's kind of weird. Okay, <laughs> what's that all about? All right. <laughs> so there was some strange stuff going on that you just, I, I'm a small Windsor girl, you know, whatever, small town and going to see all this stuff. It's like, oh, wow, this is different. So it took a little bit of, um, it took some time to get used to that. That's yeah. for sure. You know what I would, yeah. listen, for you, uh, I guess, what was, I guess, the difference between uh, sober Bob and the not sober Bob? Now, you had to ex have experienced that at different times, right, over the years. On every and, level. Yeah. Every level, and, absolutely. And what, was, what was the difference and, and how did you deal with that? I think in the beginning, I really was naive. I, I came from, you know, I wasn't a partier growing up. Um, I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I thought, felt like I had a lot of growing up to do. This was a whole world that was new to me. And um, I didn't really, to fight it, I wasn't feeling that at all. I wasn't there. I'm like, okay, I guess this is normal. I don't know. What do I know? And, um, and then it got to the point where it was like, oh, I think it was the second or third year in the playoffs when they lost out. I think, I don't even know who I was sitting with. It was another girlfriend or wife. And I remember us just crying in the seats when they lost out in the first round, not because we lost and we're not going on to the next round, possibly the Stanley Cup. No, we knew that the guys were going to go on a three-day bender for fun and our life was going to be hell. So this sucks. So I think that's when I started getting a, a taste of the negative side of addiction for sure. So there was definite, like it was a roller coaster ride with him with the, you know, sober for a year, you know, crash for, for two or whatever. It was just up and down and up and down. You didn't know what to expect. And I just, I was a classic enabler codependent. I mean, I just stuck it out. I was going to fix them. I was going to help them. And it didn't happen until he was ready. And that was the motorcycle crash of 94 that sent him, you know, uh, signing with Chicago. 
got out of the deal in Detroit and then off to rehab after Brogan was born. So that's when, and sober Bob was awesome. Oh yeah. Awesome. And see, I had glimpses of that when we were dating and when we were engaged and early on, they were always, he was always trying to get sober and stay sober. It just didn't last. It didn't stick. And then getting to Chicago and having almost, mm, I don't even know how long he was out in California, four months, six months. And, um, that one stuck and it was awesome. It was, I mean, you know what it's like, Nux, they all think you're having this wild, crazy life all the time, but you settle down, you're married and you have kids and it's like, yeah, it's, it's mom and dad and the kids and doing the normal, you know, tedious daily stuff. And you throw some hockey in there too, his career. So that was it. When, you know, that the, the Bob at home at times on, under the influence, was he, angry was he mad or was he just was he someone else when he was like that i'd say a little bit i think he knew enough um especially after retirement to just stay away he'd either go on a bender for you know a week or two and disappear knowing that he's in big big trouble so i'm not going to go home and face that music i'll just keep going i'm already in trouble um and if he was home he'd putz around and stay and you know working on the cars or putzing around doing stuff and just staying away from us um with shame, you knew he, you could see it on his face, the shame, especially coming off a of bender, yeah. definitely. But, um, and then, I mean, younger Bob, like when we were just dating and stuff, well, like I said, it was just a party atmosphere. You just thought that was the norm. It wasn't, and the mood swings weren't there except for like, you know, coming down from stuff, just being tired and, you know, cranky. But no, he was, he really stayed to himself, I think, when he knew he was going to be really hitting it hard that he just stayed away. Especially once we had kids, he didn't want the kids to see any of that. You know, I'm just going to be honest. This is hard for me, but it, it's um, Chris and I met through recovery, um, and I I can uh, you know I don't even know how to say this. It, it's amazing to to be here and hear you talk because you know the day before I went into rehab and went into the NHL uh, substance abuse, I was um, I actually watched the documentary. The, the day before, less than 24 hours before, um, and, you know, the, the whole thing you guys were talking about, uh, you know, the the cocaine issue at, in Windsor and how, like, what was he thinking? And it's like, you know what he, he, he thought it was okay, and that's what we do. Like, that's what, you, you know, the insanity of, like, just thinking, like, I can think back now of, of things that I would do, including the time I watched this documentary, I flew in... Um, you know, from Toronto, I live in Chicago myself, and, and I was just kind of on a three, four day little business thing. I went to the NHLPA golf outing. I flew in. It's 10 at night, and I had to drive to Madison, Wisconsin, which is like two hours. This is, a, you know, 1030 at night, and I'm, you know, I wasn't sober, like, right? Like, I was partying and doing my thing, and and, and I and I drove uh, to Madison, and I never told this story, um, to be honest. I, I just think I have to. Um, and I watched the documentary while I was driving, while, you know, thinking that was okay. And I remember, um, you know, just seeing this, this, uh, first off, the documentary was so amazing that to really kind of like, uh, display Bob as a human. And second off, like, it's just, when I saw like the effect he had, right? Like the, the, when, when your daughters and kids uh, t- spoke and they and, and just kind of, I don't know. Like I said, the next day I went golfing at 9 a.m. I was basically kind of sick and I just gave up in front. It was like this big dramatic thing, but it was really just a cry for help. And I had a buddy who flew me out to Malibu and, and I, you know, I haven't looked back since. It's been almost three years. And, and I think, you know, I had to call my wife and tell her we were supposed to go to Italy for 14 days uh, and I had to call her and tell her I won't be home. I'll see you in 30. And I don't know. I just, it's a, it's, it's like, I'm sitting here and I, I, I haven't said much and it's just because like, I don't know what to say. I'm just kind of like, I just appreciate you being on this. I appreciate, you know, you talk about moving on. It's like moving on. What do you like? That's crazy. It's not moving on. It's like, you got to get to a point where you accept what's happened and you take the positives out of that. Right. Like, and it, it's like, you never move on. And I can't relate to, to the trauma you had. I, I can just say that that documentary, I mean, you know, I'm worried about today. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, the goal is to never, ever have to go back down that road, but that documentary changed my life. Uh, it's wow. pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible to, 
you know, and it's, it's, it's why I'm kind of, this isn't like, I, I feel like really uncomfortable because I just haven't said much. I can't like, you know, so You're I, fine, Timothy, you know, like, in, and I, <laughs> but anyways, Tim, I'll send thank you, you I'll so send much. Me, I'll send you the invoice for that therapy session, but <laughs> okay. No, but I, no, I just honestly, want to say congratulations yeah. to you. Yeah. Wow. Three years. That's incredible. Yeah. And, Good for and you. And, and thank you, you for sharing and being honest. No, wow. I, I just got, I'm just sitting here and I'm just like, man, I don't even, I'm not even, you know, and then you just, I'm just like the reality of, of. Even meeting uh, Knox, Chris, I mean, it, it's it's kind of both of you. His documentary, I watched his 10 years ago, 2012. My wife, I remember then I was using and, and doing my thing and not, you know, I was just like, I'm not that bad, right? Like, I'm judging this documentary <laughs> of Knox. And, and my wife's, you know, she's crying. She's like, that's you. But, you know, and it's not so much about you know how bad did someone have it it's more of like you know like the consequences it's like we're all in this like internal like prison cell of like you know we can't get out of and and i you know here i am and nux asked me to be on a podcast and i'm like you know i couldn't say no and then like you're one of the guests we you know we haven't even launched it yet and i'm just it's kind of a surreal moment for me uh and it's it's given me a really you know i'm just in a sense of gratitude but i'm also like really nervous so Bear with me. Wow. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. But I love you making that statement because that was Bob. He'd look back and go, okay, no, I'm not that bad. In rehab, there'd be guys in there, well, I'm not that bad. Oh, they took so many perks today. Well, I'm not that bad. <laughs> Bob did that all the time, trust me, just to justify and, and of course, deflect. He was a master Yeah, no, and it's, I mean, me I, I, yeah, that's why in the documentary, I was like, man, I can relate to just, I mean, it's just like, you didn't want to do what you were doing. Right. Like you didn't like I didn't really want to do what I was doing, but I got so to the point where like it was controlling me and I couldn't. And obviously like the fear of getting sick and and all that. And at that time, a little over two and a half years ago, I was I never would think in a million years that I would be able to live the life I'm living. And then you talked about how great it was to be with sober Bob. And I just thought about my wife and how much she tells me, like, it, this is so much better. Um, and like I Absolutely. said, it's, it's how long have you been married? Uh, we've been together for 10 years. We have two little kids. We got married. Uh, we're about three years, probably. I mean, she was, I mean, no, 2000. Yeah. We, we've been together like 2018. We got married. Um, oh, wow. I think that's right now. You know, now I'm going to get in trouble for this. I don't know. You it's are like so three in trouble, <laughs> buddy. You it's better go figure out that date. Three or four quick. years, but <laughs> we've been together for 10, but she was, you know, she was with me throughout a lot of that of, of just, you know, when you and I wonder if she felt like I did. I can't put, begin to think what she was going through. But I know for me, one of the big things sticking with Bob, I'm like, there's no way I'm putting in all this time and someone else is going to benefit from all the work I put in this relationship. No, no. And him getting was... sober. Screw that. No, good for you. <laughs> I'm I sticking mean, this yeah, one out. <laughs> no, like the ride or die type. Like it's it's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have my wife, you know, and I think my wife was more just – you know, she was just like waiting for me to really want to help me. Like she couldn't, she, she knew, like, I just, it, it really does, you know, and I, and when I talk about, like, I don't like talking about this. I, you know, I mean, it's not, com I, I, I'm not, com I don't think I ever really have outside of anonymous stuff. Right. So this is new to me and it's just, I, you know, I just, I'm not doing it to think I can help people. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I can, you got to really help yourself. I mean, I'm just trying to give like a little hope to someone you know, it comes down to really wanting to do this. Like I can't, my wife couldn't want me to not drink and use, you know, pills more than I didn't want to. Right. Like that's just, that's the truest statement, you know, right like, and, and, it, and I couldn't imagine, like I could speak for probably like some of, you know, Bob's behaviors, but I can't speak for you dealing with that. Right. Like I, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's awesome to hear. And I know I'm off track of probably our whole thing here, but like I not said, at all. That's it. Not I'm done. I'm all. done. That's <laughs> awesome. No. Tim, not at all. And yeah. remember, I, and I remember this, I'm only as sick as my secret. So there's nothing wrong with um, bringing this to light and talking about those kind of things. And, you know, certainly people that are going to tune in and listen to us. And, and, and that's what I want to ask you about, Danny. And you said it. You said it. Listen, I was your classic enabler. So it, what did you learn if you could share something with somebody who might be out there listening and who's dealing with a family member that is suffering through addiction right now, um, a wife, a girlfriend, a significant other, whatever, no matter who that family member is, but maybe more so a wife or girlfriend, what would your suggestion be to them? to try and because I, 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 you know you can't change anybody right we can't Absolutely. change anybody 
Absolutely. But what what would maybe your, a suggestion from you, or what have you learned from your situation? Well, I can't only speak to myself and my situation. Everybody's right. situation's different. Right. And I think that every mm. woman, um, a, a partner, whatever, that's in a situation like that, I think that's... Um, everyone has a breaking point. Everyone has a point where they throw in the towel or they're willing to go get help with them. I think my biggest thing I think I learned was one of the first, and I've been to a few rehab stints with Bob, being a part of, you know, participating in family group. Um, There were some, yeah, I've been to a few. And I think the first one that I went to and spent a lot of time in out in California, I was resentful towards Bob. I was pissed right off. I'm like, why am I going to a group? Why do I have to go do intensive? Why? You're the one with the problem, not me. Not me. Yeah, I had a whole set of baggage all of my... I had the whole Louis Vuitton collection of my own that I had to deal with. (laughs) And that was something that I had to work on and and learning about myself. I mean, I had a lot of growing up to do and learning about me. Never mind Danny taking care of Bob. I had to take care of myself. So that was a big part of our, you know our issues, I think that it helped in, um, going forward, definitely in recovery. I mean, that was one of the hurdles, uh, uh, amongst many, but I think that, and the, well, I don't even know what rehab it was. I think we were down in Florida. How bad is that to say that? I'm losing track of what <laughs> rehab we were in, but, um, I'm pretty sure it was down in Florida. It was a good experience at Renaissance. That's exactly where it was. And we were sitting in a group setting and I was the odd man out. Everyone else there were addicts. They were doing, and that was their program. They invited the family member uh, into those groups and really hearing some of the stuff was an eye opener. But I remember this guy sitting in his chair and saying to me, the counselor, uh, Danny, what are you sticking it out for? What are you doing? Yeah. And then he sat back in his seat and he goes, and if you tell me love, I'm going to start singing Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> and that was an eye opener. And I honestly didn't have an answer. I had to come back and ask my therapist here in Windsor. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. What am I supposed to say? Like, Why am I And here? he really, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he really helped me with, with dealing with that. And it was the um, time invested in our relationship, how much time we had and um, having four kids and was I willing to walk away from that investment of my time and our the work that we had already put in so far? So I think that's something, like I said, it's a, it's an evaluation, self-evaluation if you're in that situation that you just got to ask yourself, you know, am I going to stick it out? Am I Do I really want to work on this? And if you do, you got to give it 100%, and that might even include you going to get help for yourself. Well, it's and, a family uh, recovery, right? Like It, it, it is, it is absolutely. And, it, and it's you, the most important thing you said there is you're going for you. Like in and and because like the like I said I speak for the the psycho addict who's eventually like and I've done this before with my wife where I'm like I'm mad at her because she doesn't understand me and it's like you know she should be going for me and it's like no she should be going for her because you know like you gotta I mean it starts with the person I mean I I don't know I it's you know there's all everything I'm saying I'm like you know I'm just it, it's uh I didn't make any of this up so. It's a lot of help and, and you're spot on. Absolutely. <laughs> no, and you're not just, saying anything yeah, I mean, wrong. You you're doing great. <laughs> you know, I was told in rehab, like you can't, you know, you can't love or, you know, you can't love or trust anything if you don't love and trust yourself. Right. Like, I mean, a lot of my thing, my mm-hmm. things was self-acceptance. It's still, I still struggle with it today. And it's just making, you know, those numb decisions where I don't want to feel, I don't want to have to feel because, uh, you know, that's just too hard. Um, I don't want to live in this present moment and, I got away with it for a long time and it worked a lot of times um, and I had fun doing it. But, you know, today I, I today I can at least be honest, like I can at least, huge. you know, I can at least look at myself and just whether right, wrong, um, you know, good, bad. I could at least go to bed and just be like, you know, you're trying. And and, and how freeing is that? Yeah, And it's like you could right wake there, up and liberating. just try get better. But like. It comes, right? Like, it's not like I don't think about, you know, you know, it's it's just really about today. And, and I think as far as a relationship goes and my 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 wife and I were doing unbelievable. Right. And, and it's not because it's just me. It's like she's she's got to put That's in work, awesome. too. And, and and and, you know, you're saying a lot of amazing things. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank and you. that that is awesome, uh, Tim. And, you know, when you think uh yeah, that documentary, and I think of Bob, and um, 
the, yeah, all he's been through with hockey, the fighting, all that stuff. And I, I, he retires from hockey, and then I get to know him a little bit. And what a lot of people didn't know, and a lot of people that were closer to him, let's say, they knew the motorcycle stuff and the car. I did not have a clue. I went in your garage, <laughs> and oh I'm with God. him. And, and you, Tim, you howl at this. Like, here yeah, I've been out with Bob playing hockey, going here, doing this, doing that. And there was a point where we both weren't sober when we were together. Okay, we went through some of those different, my relapse, and it wasn't because of Bob, but we had both relapsed, and we were running around together a little bit. That being said, I had an opportunity, uh, and I was at Bob's home, beautiful home uh, in in Windsor, and he brought me out to the garage. He said, Knox, check this out. And I'm like, he said, I love putting cars together. I'm there, putting cars together. What are you <laughs> Like he had every pot, he had a Chevelle SS in there. It was pristine, 70. beautiful car. He built yep. this goddamn car, and he's got all these ra- uh, racks on the side wall, and he has all different pieces. He was building another car, and I'm like, I would not know where to- he had everything marked and, and, and little baggies. Yeah, with all the I was bags. freaking shocked, Danny. <laughs> I'm there. This kid does- can do this. Like I did not. I didn't think he was capable of sitting and concentrating to do, to, to do something like that. I, I, he, it blew me away. Well, you know, <laughs> first of all, it blew me away. He was definitely ADHD. And that was diagnosed in one of his stints in Maryland, where he had his IQ tested and he tested very high 146. He was very proud of that number for his IQ. And he, Typical ADHD is this whole lighthouse effect, I guess, and that you focus in on something. Whatever it is your passion at that time, you're going to learn everything about it. So whether it was watches or artwork or cars or motorcycles or boats or building a house or whatever it was, he would read everything about it, learn so much about it. And that was a stage, you know, one of his phases was he was really good at taking the cars apart. I got to just let you know the truth yeah. there. He was great at taking these things apart, labeling the crap out of everything. Every brake line, electrical line, he'd have <laughs> tape on there, write I everything shocked. on there. He knew shocked. his stuff. And that was his passion. Like he loved numbers matching like original muscle cars. So his 70 Chevelle, yeah. he got me a 68 Charger for my birthday one year. Um, uh, we had a 71 Chevelle, whatever. He would go and he'd read up all the stuff. And this LS6, 454, Chevelle that we had he knew like he'd read the numbers on there he knew okay it was this color and it had this this is when it was built this is where it was built and he had everything had to be matching and that was that was almost a game for him oh my gosh did he love it but you want to know what ducks you telling that story my favorite part when you came over and I hope you remember this was sitting in the lounge area you know with the all around their little smoking yeah. area and the TV. But yeah. Bob was like a kid with you. And he just wanted yeah. you to tell him more and more stories, all yeah. stories, but especially about your father-in-law. Yeah, yeah. He, Do you remember? About <laughs> he loved, tell me another yeah. story. Tell us another <laughs> like one, he was just, yeah. Tell me about tell Whitey. Us, Everybody. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> all he wanted to know. Absolutely. And, that's what I remember about that visit when you were at the house. Yeah, but, uh, and, and I did. And I did tell him. And I got to tell you, um, when I, I think about that, and, and and Bob being that big kid, I always looked at him. He, he he was inquisitive, but you know when I looked at that time and the opportunities I had to be with him. Now Bob and I, Tim, we went to Abu Dhabi for like <laughs> um, this is crazy. Went to Abu Dhabi and we roomed together for seven days and we played hockey over there in the arab world here we are playing hockey against arabs and russians and bob got cut but one of the russians cut him and i never saw him hold back and have restraint like he did that day he wanted to he would have killed the kid the russian but he let him slide they went in the room stitched him up doctor came in stitched him up he had probably i don't know about seven stitches it was a good one no Novocaine, just do it. Um, did them up. We went out afterwards. We're together for a week. We flew from Dubai after that. We drove to Dubai, and then we flew to Afghanistan for another 
seven days. And then we came back to old Canada and we played for like a week of alumni games. So we were together like three weeks, rooming together, in each other's face the whole time. I so know where this is going. I know where this is going. Yeah. And at the end of one of these alumni games, the last game we are at, we're in Ottawa. And we're having a big dinner with all the people that supported. They bought the tickets and everything. And we're all, everybody's interacting. And the guys were sitting together. And I'm sitting was with Was General Bob. Rick Hillier there? Uh, was yeah, he at he that? Was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And... It's all coming Bob back is to sitting me now. across from me. I'm sitting here across from Bob, and I think Glenn Anderson was there, someone else. And behind me, someone said, Hey, Knuckles. And I had just asked Bob a question. I said, Bob, I bet you can't wait to get home to a home cooked meal with Danny. And he said, Yeah. And he said, I said, What's your favorite meal? And he started telling me, and someone said, Hey, Knuckles. And I turned around to see who said something, and it was another guy and I, he asked me a question i answered then i turned around and bob said hey fuck you he said you turn your fucking back on me you just asked me a fucking question and he got up and threw a punch and i ducked and the two of us start swinging away now shocker we had, had plates of food there right and the table got knocked over everybody jumped jumped in to break it up and the mashed potatoes went flying across the room off his plate and hit some lady in the face. She was sitting there with a the mashed potatoes, not the plate. And I'm telling you, that was it. The two of us. So they broke it all up. And we were kind of mad at each other for a little bit. But um, we quickly put that one to rest. Uh, we didn't talk for probably about two weeks. But uh, it, it was, was crazy. It was a lover's quarrel after yeah, three it weeks. Yeah, it was. A lot Honestly, of close quarters. It happens. <laughs> I, I absolutely love Bob. And, and and again, I met him in retirement. I met him late in life. We went to Afghanistan trips. We had, uh, it was unbelievable the time we had together. The things we got to enjoy together for a guy. The first time I met you in England, right? We were both newly sober, right? Yes. Or for a little bit. And yeah, you guys were was, white knuckling at that trip. That yeah. was a tough one. That Remember I told tough. you, Tim? <laughs> yeah. Sobriety with we no were. help. Just trying to do oh. it. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that feels good. <laughs> oh, but uh, that, that was, was a, a long trip. couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, right? it was a great trip. Yeah. I joked when I talked to you a couple weeks ago, Nux, that was our, yeah. our trip of sleeping a lot. Every time we got on the tour bus, everybody just conked out it was just non-stop one one rink after another all over wales and england and uh we went up to scotland that was cool yeah but, it was uh, awesome that was a great yeah. trip yeah yeah it was fun and then we got to go to dominican again right we went to the D dominican together we <laughs> enjoyed that trip somewhat and um <laughs> the sun and the fun with the nhl yeah. alumni yeah um that was that was another, that was another good, good one, time so. yeah another good story there yeah yeah, as always, but always. um, yeah. But uh, listen, uh, in retirement, and then the alumni and playing all those games and everything, and um, Bob passing on way too early. Um, you found out after he had CTE. Mm -hmm. uh, he donated his brain to uh, the Boston University um, mm -hmm. that program, which uh, I will be doing. Awesome. Um, were you were you surprised um, that he had that, or did you think he might have? And again, this is like he was only the second one, second hockey guy, right, to yeah. go into that program. Were you surprised that he had CTE? Um, no, I guess not. Mm -hmm. I I think honestly, I was really hoping for answers, like yeah. to explain, you know. But it's the whole, you know cart before the horse. I, I think I was looking for, oh, this is why he, you know, did the things that he did. This is why, but that wasn't what I, that, I thought that's what I was looking for. That's not what I got. Um, I ended up having to go get a whole, you know, lesson. I mean, gosh, it's quite extensive. The questionnaire that you do with them, it's about a 40 minute to an hour questionnaire that you do. Um, once you donate the brain, once they've, um, They've got that. I remember when Bob passed away, they called right away, but it was, I'm so thankful that Bob and I had that conversation because that was something that we had caught like the fall before he had passed 
20 minutes or 60 minutes, I mean, 20, 20 or 60 minutes or something it was on. And they had said they only had the one um, hockey player's brain donated at that yeah. time. And uh, they put, were, yes, and they were putting yeah. a call out for basically that. And I remember looking at him like, well, you'd be a fine specimen, like, you know, joking. And he's like, yeah. absolutely, donate my brain. And that was the only conversation we had. So I knew when he passed, that was something I had to do. And I was so thankful that they called because I wouldn't have known how to go about that. They reached out so that um, everything worked out, I guess, okay for that. They ended up getting the brain. They harvested the brain. They got that. Um, then about a month after, we had to do the whole questionnaire thing. There was a lot of stuff in there I didn't know, like how many concussions did Bob have? Uh, you know, and the list is, like I said, they're talking to you for almost an hour. So there were a lot of things I didn't know. Um, I highly suggest if anyone is planning on doing that, maybe get the questionnaire ahead of time and maybe you can answer those questions before your loved one actually has to go through all that. Yeah. And then it took about three months till we got the results. And um, it was Dr. McGee, I think that was the one who had told me that Bob was um, a two borderline three um, and that they really had to search for the, the bruising on the frontal lobe uh, to find it. They had a hard time. He had a resilient brain is what they said. Um, and I'd have to agree with that considering how yeah. many knocks he took to the head, but also the motorcycle accidents and all the stupidity that went along with that. But they did find it. And, um, no, I wasn't shocked to hear the results. I think I was just really hoping I was going to get more from it as far as ex thinking it was a big explanation, a big light bulb moment of that's why he was an addict. That's why he was an alcoholic. I don't know. I was thinking that would be the answer. And that wasn't the closure I got from that, but having the answers and, and learning more about CTE definitely helped after the fact. Did they give you like answers, uh, not answers, I guess you just said that, but like, is there signs though of like someone possibly have like memory loss or like stuff like that? And you know, those little things. Um, that Absolutely. There are a few things and it's hard because of Bob being an addict yeah. that they're like, okay, is that, yeah. you know, wet brain or is that this, that they, I mean, it was really hard. Um, you know, him being forgetful and forget, I mean, gosh, he'd forget his name sometimes. I mean, my goodness, he could take the same way home and still get, you know, every day and still get lost. His memory sucked. But um, how much is that just because mm -hmm. is, I don't know. So you didn't know, but there were some um, certain questions that they did ask that, uh, like I said, I think if, if, Tim, if you're going to donate your brain, I'm not sure, but in, in Nux for yourself, I would get those questions and fill those out yourself. I think it would be hard for a loved one to be able to fill in all of those blanks. Some of them yeah, were easy and some of them was like, n no yeah, idea. That's certainly good advice. And I, I will do that. And, you know, um, thinking, um, that macho Bob, okay. On the <laughs> ice, the tough Bob and the muscle cars and the bike, like, you know, it's when you see both sides of them, you're like, where does that come from? We talk about addiction, okay? And here we are talking about it. And where did that start? And, you know, in almost all cases, and I'm, I'm not going to be Joe therapist here or psychiatrist, but I've, I've been through intensive therapy. I've been <laughs> through quite a few different therapists. And the... The, the when you look at the root of it a lot of times it's some type of childhood trauma uh that we it seems to be in a lot of people who suffer th from addiction or alcoholism this seems to be cases of childhood trauma whether it's uh, uh, uh physical abuse sexual abuse emotional abuse w whatever did you c ever make that connection there with bob um, in therapy? no, we did, we did talk about it. Uh, there were times, um, it seemed that it would come up more so after therapy, we would talk about it because especially if he was in private groups, private sessions that he would, um, come out of something and say, Hmm, what do you think about this? He really didn't have anything. Maybe he blocked something out. That's a good possibility. Um, I know his dad was tough. He yep. was a Windsor cop and he was a tough guy, you know, tough dad. And it was, it was of that era as well. That's the most, and we didn't like, um, his dad got his death. Bob was 17 when his dad yeah. died and they pinned a lot of his behavior on that and his family members, not his mom, his mom is, you know, she's in total denial that, um, you know, this didn't happen until after daddy died. No, the aunt said th these Norman Bob were well on their way before Al and, uh, had passed away. 
and that I don't just know. maybe kicked it into another gear. Yeah, definitely, at that it's point. next level. Was there absolutely. a history of it at all in in the family? Like, uh, you know, yes, absolutely, okay. on both sides. Yeah, yeah same. Here. But I mean, like I said, that that was a hush hush. Yeah, that's taboo. You don't talk about that stuff. But yes, <laughs> no, just the era that they grew up in, right? Like Bob's mom wasn't willing to talk about that stuff, and um, you ended up hearing it from other people. But yeah. So knowing good. that, and you know that both sides of the family, yeah. And and now you have your four children embarking on their lives away from mom. There you're an empty nester now. Um, Not yet, but almost. Well, it's almost. right around the corner. <laughs> you're yes. there. You're I'm you're there. right there. That being said, um, um, have you addressed those things with your kids at all? I've talked about addiction, alcoholism, and you know what oh. happened with dad. And um, have you yep. addressed any of that with your kids? Absolutely. Um, that was stuff that we spoke with them quite openly about when Bob was alive. I remember being pregnant with Brogan that Bob was like, oh my gosh, I don't want our kids to know anything about my past, my his, nothing, nothing. And it was actually a therapist that guided him through that and what, uh, answering the questions that were age appropriate at the time. Um, honesty is definitely the best policy. And seeing that uh, you were showing the kids, we showed the kids that we had weaknesses, we were human, we were far from perfect and where we came from that, like what we did with that. Um, so that was, that was really important for us to, to maintain. And Bob did a great job with honesty with the kids. Any yeah. times, I mean, he wouldn't, you know, just go out of his way to talk about it. But if they asked, he always answered honestly. And that continued on in his passing. Um, always, you know, being the mama bear harping on them of eating properly and, uh, you know, heart disease in the family, addictions in the family. Um, I know at the beginning of COVID, two of my kids went away for help uh, dealing with PTSD. I was I was so proud of them and uh, and them recognizing that they had some issues that they wanted to work on and to deal with, and there was no shame in that. Uh, yeah, there's no stigma in this household. It's uh, we op we talk about it openly, and it's healthy. And um, I, the girls going out there was the best experience for them. And I have one child's getting into one of the child, one of my adult children is getting into mental health and addictions. She's taking those courses. Um, the other ones in sports psychology and, you know, the other two, they're doing such great things. And it's, I, I, I'm thankful for the, the groundwork that Bob laid early on with the honesty thing. Cause if he had left and not been honest with them for all those years and having to deal with it after in his passing, that would have been really yeah. difficult. No, but that that's the information is out there, right? Like my kids can Google, it's there. What's yeah. the point yeah. of bullshitting? And and and, and <clears throat> you said talking, like talking is like the healthiest. That's what saves me right now. It's like, because I'm like, an, I'm an isolator. Like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Like, that's kind of naturally why I would do what I do. But it, it's, you know, I have kids and my kids are seven and four. And no. Communication is key. Yeah, yeah. And keeping and, and the so lines like, of communication open at all times. That's and I'm not huge. doing what I'm doing to tell them, like, I don't judge alcohol or like, any, you know, I don't judge. It's just like, I'm, I'm hopefully the hope is that one day they understand and ho hopefully they don't, they don't remember who I, you know, that guy or never have to meet that guy. But like, I'm not doing this to tell them they can't ever do and have a drink. It's just like, just the awareness of like, hey, like, you know, hopefully they know why they're, they're doing things. Cause I, I knew it's like, I, mine was a complete escape, right? Like that's, and I still want to escape at times. I still have, but talking is, I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. You said that word and that's what you guys do. Cause that, that is like, like, I think Nux, you said it earlier. You're only sick as your secrets. Right. And yeah. you, you, Bob used to say that all well, the time. I mean, time. it's true though. Absolutely. And it's, it's like too, it's like when you talk about it, you realize, you know, when, and, and I mean, there's a lot of people that go through things, right. You know, and if you don't talk about it, you're just going to be, you're going to victimize and, and eventually just feel alone. And it's hard. I mean, I'm not saying it's the easiest thing to do. But oh, it's not easy. Yeah. No, Honesty that's, and communication. That's, <laughs> listen, that's what they, uh, when you hear people who go through addiction, and alcoholism, I mean, you, you hear them say, you got to do the work. Yeah, it's work. If you've done the work, then you understand what the work is. And yeah. that's part of it. It's mm -hmm. it's being able to address those things, talk about those things, talk about those things which make you uncomfortable. And it's not an easy, easy road, but it's it's well worth it when you go through that uh, that that process. It's not an easy one, but again, well worth it 
Um, it's worth it if you work it, right, Nux? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the kids. <laughs> and Tim. Uh, and yeah, I yeah. got to see. I got to see Bob with the kids, and and I I don't think a lot of people who saw Bob as a player saw him fighter get knocked out. He got knocked out that time by Todd Ewan, out cold. Got, just stayed buckled. in the game, come back, yep. fought him again. He had the Domi fights and all that. Everybody looks at Bob, man, he's the heavyweight, the best fighter of all time, I believe. And um, they don't know how he was. A lot of people, those people do not have a clue who Bob was as a person and how he was. How was he with the kids? I got to see it. Ex explain to people how he was well with he was my biggest children. kid for starters he was <laughs> yeah. the with zero concept of time i'm sure you remember that Knox. Oh, yeah. zero concept of time and it would be a school night or whatever and bob's favorite thing to do was pull out the chevelle one of the cars put the top down and didn't care what time it was he didn't care if he was pulling kids out of bed we're going for milkshakes or we're going for ice cream we're doing like he really was just a big kid and it's it's funny you talked about the documentary and it, it it's tough to watch. That's dark. It's it's such a it bummer. It's sad. But I remember when the kids and I saw it for the first time, when we got to check everything out, it was sent to us. And I remember watching it going, wow, they're really missing a big part of our lives. If you notice, all of Chicago is missing from this documentary. Well, because those were our awesome days. And to the point of you know, the people that were fans of Bob's and the tough guy, and then even the ones that love that his partying and his wild side, um, yeah, they wouldn't appreciate hearing how, yeah, we got up today with the kids and had a family breakfast and Bob kid took the kids to nursery school. We went to the park. He took two to the rink. I mean, it was so normal and almost boring to most people, but it was family life. It was very average, very normal. It was awesome. It was awesome. There were no ups and downs. It was very, um, you know. Just no, 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 like life. two highs, two lows. Like, was what was None did Bob that. talk much about like what it meant, like what, what the difference of being a dad in those, you know, being before sobriety and then sober? Um, honestly, he got sober uh, right after I had our first. We had our oh, okay, first child. Okay, yeah. So no, yeah, so that yeah, for him, ahead. that whole run of having all four kids, he was sober that entire time. Um, it wasn't until the year that he retired that he relapsed hard hard so that's when the kids and they were still young enough especially the twins were just three or four years old when that happened so they certainly have no recollection of it the girls the older two definitely have some you know bits and pieces they do recall and it's not pleasant what they saw um that side of dad because he was so awesome for eight years like he was just the most fun dad you know, let's go water skiing. Let's go ride the bikes. Let's go, you know, all of our kids had dirt bikes and for whatever. It was just awesome. Like always a good time and always, always fun. I had to be the hard ass. I was the tough one. <laughs> you know, do your homework, sit out of the table, yeah. do this, do that. And he was the good cop all the time, Mr. Fun Guy. And, you know, he was just one big kid. He was awesome. He was really so, good, supportive and um, How about for you? Denise. And we get Bob, okay? And um, and I want to ask you again another thing about Bob that maybe, uh, but I want to talk about you and what it was like for you after his passing, bringing up the kids alone, and and then your personal life. Have have you moved on in your personal life with someone else? Do you have somebody else in your life? I, am I being too personal there, or? It's you, is that Max. okay to have? <laughs> no, but okay I, I, I just, again, I, maybe I'm put. I feel like I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but have you moved on and met somebody else? And I've and, met a wonderful guy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I okay. joke that, um, it took me a while. Uh, it took me a few. Those are big boots to fill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my gosh. Didn't that guy say that when Andrew was taking me to the airport one time, he says, well, how do you know each other? Well, that's my girlfriend. And you're with Bob's widow? Like, oh. whoa. And he said that those are some big shoes to fill. And poor yeah. Andrew's eyes were this big. But yeah, we've been dating for a few years and he's awesome. He's great with the kids and he respects our story, which is huge. He loves Good. talking about Bob. He supports the ride and all of our, everything that we do. Uh, you know, he'd call me right before doing this. Let me know how it goes. And uh because everybody gets the big, do not call me from one till two. Oh. I'm doing this. I got this window. And uh, no, he's an awesome guy. But I joke because, um, Nux, I'm sure you remember our house on the water. Yep. I've since moved from there. But okay, we had car parts from one end to the other. 
Never mind the garage being full, but then every end of the house and it would trickle from the basement up to the main floor. It was fenders, quarter panels, you know, you name it. Yep. It was everywhere. Everything. Pieces of glass, everything. And um, it was a nightmare when he passed away having to organize all that stuff. And it was weird though. I got to tell you this. Right before he passed away, it wasn't even a month. And I'm like, you know, if anything happens to you, I got a catalog. Like what engine block is that to? Like he had 12 engine blocks in the garage, right? Transmissions, you name it. Everything's on stands. I'm like, I don't know what goes with what. If I have anybody come in here, whatever. And fast forward a month later, he passed away. But we did start the list, which was a good thing. But... The reason I'm bringing all that up is I thought, okay, when he passed away and I finally got rid of everything slowly, took time, did it. I meet another muscle car freak and, you know, he's into oh, okay. Camaros and in the motorcycles and the boats. So the things. I'm like, oh, this is a sick joke right <laughs> yeah. here. This is not funny, <laughs> sir. I was thinking, oh my gosh, when I thought I was free of it all. Nope, not so fast there, Probert. Got mm -hmm. another muscle car loving guy. So he's great. The kids love him. He's been a part of my life Good. for almost seven years, so Good can't wait for you to meet him. Yeah. And to have that male figure around uh, certainly, I'm sure, helped you in, in, in you know. Yes and no. Me. It was very, um, I think that uh, he really stood back and respected yeah. the ages of the kids and that they weren't ready for that. Um, you know, we Just don't live yet. together or anything. He's still doing his thing yeah. and it's perfect. It's really, he's respecting the whole fi family dynamics. And like I said, our story and who Bob was and, uh, why we continue to honor him every year with the ride and other ways that we do things. And, um, you know, there's been things with the Red Wings and whatever he's joined us. It's been, it's been awesome. And, uh, a big part of the healing, I think, you know, 12 years, gosh, it's going to be 12 years this July. Wow, uh, July fifth, right? July fifth. Yeah, 5th. good one. Yeah. I remember it, it, Bob. I I was living in Oregon. I went out and got sober, right? Again, um, as you know, I struggled with this, and uh, I was living in Oregon, and Bob called me, and it was a sad day morning, and he called me. And said, hey, Knuckles, what are you doing? I said, hey, Proby, how are you? What's going on? He said, I'm in Vancouver. He said, come on, come on, why don't you take a ride up and, and, and spend the weekend with me? I said, well, when are you heading back to Detroit? He says, tomorrow. I'm in Oregon. <laughs> I said, Bob, I'm in Oregon. I'm like a 17 hour drive from where you are. Told you, he zero concept thought, of time, zero. Yeah, he just thought like I could jump in the car and, you know, buzz over there in two hours. <laughs> Like, it was so funny. But I guess that if there's one thing people should know about Bob, that I guess we don't realize him, about him. Something maybe you could share with us about Bob Probit that, you know, maybe we, we just don't have a clue. I don't know. There were a lot of awesome things about Bob that were just um, like the pieces of our private lives that, I mean, this you might know Nux. I mean, going out from, he was a connoisseur of all food. He loved food and he loved to share um, his meal. He was always like, oh my gosh, yeah. always convinced. Try he this. Ordered, yes. And he loved to share all of it, right? Because he was always convinced he got the best thing on the menu every single time. He got the best dessert, the best appetizer, <laughs> the best steak, whatever it was. And he was always shoving food in your face. That was a fun thing with him. Um, I have to say, I mean... He, he was a good Christian, you guys, believe it or not. We had gotten back to the church that um, our pastor, Kathy and Pastor Rick here at Windsor Christian Fellowship had married us and uh, over in Dearborn, Michigan. And when we moved back from Chicago, I was just telling the kids this story last night, actually, when because um, they just met Pastor Kathy and Rick, uh, Pastor Rick and Pastor Kathy recently again. And Bob was walking down the hall in the church. And I said, <laughs> you can picture this nuts. Yeah. He sees these two. Rick and Kathy walking towards us and he just gets the biggest smile in his arms out and he's like, I'm back. <laughs> he was just so excited to be back there. And that's for me, that's where I get a lot of my strength from knowing I'll see him again someday. I know where he went, but um, he was just a fun loving guy. He was just a really good, smart guy. And he loved to listen to everybody else, you know, hear their stories. He didn't want to tell his stories. He really was so humble that way. And yeah. um, 
He really was a good guy. Funny. Oh, Great sense good. of humor. Tim, you would have loved him. He would have loved you, Tim. <laughs> Wait, you would have had him. In, you have me in stitches. <laughs> you you would have had him rolling over in stitches laughing. I'm telling you. Just a wonderful guy. and uh, But then you have that gift too, though, Nux. You got that quick wit. Yeah, You're a does. funny guy. Boston Absolutely. Absolutely. The accent helps a little bit, but yeah. Totally. <laughs> My kid, Jack, I think he still has the T-shirt you gave him, Nux, with yeah. the, sh the shocks. Going to yeah. go shock fishing. Yeah, Oak, the Oak Bluffs Monster Shock Tournament. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, he still has I'll the T-shirt. He's a good little man. And Hey, hey listen, Danny, I want to thank you for joining us here today. Awesome to uh, catch up with you again, hear a little bit more about um, how your life is going and the kids. I'm so happy the kids are doing well. Um Awesome to see you, and uh, and God bless you, and and have a happy rest of your life. And I'm sure we will uh, catch up once again. I hope so, Nux. I miss you. And, and Tim, it was yeah. so nice chatting know, with you. And thank, thank you, you too. For Obviously, me. personally, uh, there's a place in my heart for for you know most people would would expect you not to talk about your the, the situation, right? Most people would be like, oh, like that's you know, but for you to do that, part of the healing process, like the fact is, like you know. It changed my life, and I, for whatever that means. But you know, it's it's pretty amazing what you're doing, and like you said, Thank I mean, you. just keep talking because I think you know that's. He's all my you. favorite subject, so yeah. I can yeah. talk all day good. long. It's I love it. So that's I have to good. say one thing: life will never be the same after Bob died. That's for sure. It's a, something I heard in one of my widow sites, and uh, you know, Nux said he used to love singing some kind of wonderful. Yeah. And that's one thing I've always said. Life will never be the same, but it doesn't mean it can't be wonderful. And so every yeah. day we choose to try and make it as wonderful as possible for him. So, yeah, awesome. for sure. Thanks awesome. so much again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All you. Right.